Good morning. Uh, we're moving on into our next segment, uh, our next lecture. And uh, in the last lecture, what we had started looking at was um, quantum states for rotation and uh, what we were calling vibration of molecules, where the rotation of the molecule corresponded to a wave function uh, describing different probabilities as to how the molecule is oriented, and the vibrational energies were quantum states explaining the probabilities of different bond lengths of the nuclei. So classically, that would correspond to nuclei shifting back and forth. Uh, this was kind of the picture that we worked from. We said that in these diatomic molecules, 99.9 uh, .9 something percent of the mass is in the two nuclei, and so um, that was the picture of what these diatomic molecules looked like. Now, we looked at all of this. Let me move quickly through this. Just one more reference. So, um, the last example we had looked at uh, in the last lecture, in the last segment, was looking at vibrational energies um, inside molecules. This is our rotational example. Here is vibration. And so, kind of the last picture we had of this was, here's our diatomic molecule, the two nuclei, and we said that this variation in bond length behaves basically like a spring, like an ideal spring, and could be modeled with a potential energy function of one-half kx squared. So we started with the Schrodinger equation. Uh, we didn't go into the details uh, of what the wave functions looked like or how we solved them. What we did do was we just wrote down the results for the energies of the different quantum states. And then using those energy formulas, we were able to map out a set of vibrational energy quantum states. And then we were able to go in for hydrogen, so this was an example that we had worked through. And for the H2 molecule, for H2, uh, we had found out what the energies of absorption for the photons were, uh, what were the energies of the ground state and the um, first excited state. This was our zero point energy. It says in every H2 molecule, even if we take it all the way down to absolute zero, still going to have 0 0.207 eV of energy um, associated with vibration in that ground state. And then we said also we were able to determine that the uh, H2 molecule has a bond stiffness of 559 newtons per meter. That's always kind of an interesting number because, you know, if you scale something down to the level of molecules, how stiff are these chemical bonds? And we find out that they have, you know, bond stiffnesses that are, are like kind of the equivalent of a really stiff spring. You know, a really stiff spring that would be hard to shift back and forth very much. So that gives you an idea of how rigid the molecules are. So moving forward uh, from that, what we want to do now is um, we want to take a look at, um, well, let's, <clears throat> let's see all the quantum states that we've, we've looked at so far. So let's say we have a molecule, um, and we've got an electron in a, a 2s electron state, and here is an electron in a, th here's a set of 3p quantum states. And when a transition occurs, let's say that an electron drops from 3p into 2s, for example, well, not only is it changing in terms of its electron state, but it's changing in terms of its vibration and its rotation. Now, we're not going to look at any examples that involve keeping track of all of that complexity. This is just something for you to be aware of, that uh, a transition in vibration, for example, is probably not isolated. There's probably, when you jump from one vibrational state to the other, there's going to be a change in rotation that takes place at the same time. All right, so there's a you know, certain amount of complexity to that. Uh, here is the absorption spectrum for HCl for vibration and rotation, and uh, it matches the prediction that we would have 
for uh, transitions between vibration and rotational states. Also, we had talked about isotope effects, and chlorine is an interesting example. Chlorine, this is, these are HCl molecules, not, um, well, individual HCl molecules. Um, not, not hydrogen chloride in solution where it dissociates, but the molecules themselves. And uh, what we're seeing is that there's a peak due to the 35 isotope of chlorine and a peak due to the 37. Turns out chlorine has two almost equally, um, well, at least similar, uh, abundant isotopes. And so you can see there really is an isotope effect here. The two different isotopes have slightly different uh, energy levels. All right, let's move on. So what we've done is we've looked at these diatomic molecules as a way to, to look at the vibrational and rotational energies. Now we're going to move on and talk a little bit about solids. So if you remember, the, the chapter title was Molecules and Solids. And specifically, the solids we're thinking about here, I mean, there, there are solids that are made out of molecules. So like, uh, you know, sugar is a bunch of sucrose molecules. But there's other materials, you know, like diamond, for example, that's just a very extended crystal structure. It's not like it can isolate individual molecules uh, from, that, uh, from, that, from that diamond. And so here are some examples of different crystal patterns that we see. Here is sodium chloride, not as individual diatomic molecules, but as an extended crystal. And so what we find is that we have alternating, um, this is actually a cubic pattern, so it's not too uh, difficult to kind of see what's going on here. Um, every other um, site in that crystal structure, it alternates, whichever direction you go along, between sodium and chlorine nuclei. And to a good extent, you can treat this almost as if the chlorines have taken on a full extra electron and the sodiums have uh, depleted by about one full electron. Now another uh, type of material that we want to look at are metals. And so, again, I, I always have issues with these, at the tops of these slides, they have kind of the whole section title. Usually you have to read down here to find out where we are. And where we are right now is with metal bonds. So when we look at different metals, a block of iron, a block of copper, a block of gold, um, the bonding is not ionic or covalent. It's not like those crystal structures that we've been looking at. Instead, go back and, and look at some of these crystal structures. So this was an example of a, a, an extended crystal structure, something like, this isn't the pattern for diamond, but what would happen is you'd have a pair of electrons set up at each of these locations uh, in the crystal. And uh, same thing here uh, with the sodium chloride. It's just in the ionic uh, situation that that pair of electrons is shifted more towards the chlorine and it's, it's not so close to the sodium. But the same idea. We're still using pairs of electrons to generate individual chemical bonds. But in metal bonds, we have electrons that can spread out much more broadly uh, through wide regions of that block of metal. So they're not isolated to a couple of atoms or even a, a small region. Uh, electrons are in quantum states that essentially cover the whole volume of that block of metal. Now, what they're pointing out here is that the typical uh, energy of these chemical bonds is about 1 to 3 eV. But they're still strong bonds. 1 to 3 eV is pretty significant. Now, what we're going to take a, a close look at, so here's another topic. We look pretty closely at rotational energies, just let you guys know what we've closely looked at and what may be expected of you um, in uh, midterms. We've looked at rotational energies in, in a fair amount of detail. We looked at vibrational energies in a good amount of detail. We are now going to look at the free electron uh, theory or model for metals. And again, the idea is that 
metals have a core set of electrons, but then there's some number of electrons that the, the, the metal atoms just kind of donate to the community at large. Uh, and that's what's holding the entire block together. Uh, they give us this density of state formula. Um, we're going to come back and derive this. Uh, but, but right now, that's, it's probably a little too early for us to be looking at that. So let's, let's skip that for now. Um, but we're going to call this our free electron theory or model for metals. And um, most metals are really good conductors. Uh, both of electricity and their good thermal conductors, and we attribute this to the fact that metals have some number of electrons that can freely move through the entire uh, block of whatever metal we're looking at. So not only are they able to move around freely for electrical conduction or for heat conduction, that moving around freely is actually related to the bonding that takes place and, and holds the block of, um, of metal together. So there's this subset of electrons that are spread out all over and create an overall negative charge that uh, holds the, uh, is drawn together and holds the block together uh, when we take into account the positively charged nuclei. All right, so let's look at a, an example. Now, copper is what we use for most of our electrical wiring. Copper has excellent um, electrical conduction properties. And so here's my block of copper, and here are all these positively charged nuclei, and they're going to be surrounded by some number of negatively charged electrons. Now, if we look at the electron configuration for copper, uh, this takes us back to... Um, in chapter 39, I guess, looking at atoms, uh, we have our 1s2, uh, that's a core set of electrons, 2s2, 2p6, that's another core, 3s2, 3p6, that's another set of core electrons. Now what we're doing is, if you remember, we went row by row down the periodic table and said that we completed one shell of electrons here, completed another shell of electrons here, a third shell. Uh, copper if we look on the periodic table, is down in the fourth row. And so uh, what we have to consider is, well, once we get beyond these first 18 electrons, which are clearly going to be core electrons, what do we do with the other 11 electrons? And what we find is, for copper, there is a 3D set of electrons. There's 10 of them. Uh, and then there's a 4S1 uh, electron. So if I look at individual copper atoms, that's what the electron configurations look like. Now what happens when we bring a bunch of copper atoms together? And uh, what we find is that these valence shells fall into what we call bands. So I've got a 3D band of uh, electron quantum states that spread out over the entire block of metal. So it's kind of like all these electrons are being shared between all the different nuclei. But the 3D band is filled, and that's because when we look at the configuration here, 3D10, there's enough electrons to fill all of these states. Now there's a 4S band, which is higher in energy. And again, what happens here, let's, let's think of our block of copper. Uh, each atom that comes in and, and contributes to the uh, forming the block of copper, it brings in two 4S states. Now remember when we talked about um, quantum state hybridization of electron states? The 4S band of states doesn't look like a 4S state. The reason we call it 4S is because the 4S band consists of a linear combination of all the different 4S states that were brought in by all of the copper atoms. So all the individual copper atoms all have their spherically symmetric 4S states that they brought in. But when we add all of those together uh, uh, to, to create a, a linear combination, uh, that gives us states that, that look pretty different. Uh, so each atom brings in one 4S electron, but it brings in two 4S states. So there is this, so you guys know from your calculus classes, if, 
if we switch from one basis to another, uh, we still need the same number of dimensions in that basis. So we could work in terms of a basis that consists of the atomic 4s states, or we could work in terms of this new basis, which is a, a, a new orthogonal group of uh, wave functions that are linear combinations of these. So uh, we got two, uh, two n states inside this 4s band, and we've only got n electrons to fill it, and our argument is, well, this is why metals are good conductors. Because what happens in most materials, when we look at the band structure, is that the bands are full. Uh, and jumping to the next band in order to get an electron to jump into an excited state, eh, there's a pretty sizable gap that the electrons would have to jump. Um, if we've got a, a half-filled uh, band such as this, it's easy enough for the electron to find a state it's just a little higher in energy. So it just takes a little energy boost and that electron is into a new state. Now, electrons switching back from one state to the other is equivalent to the electrons moving around to different locations. If you remember uh, the infinite potential well, we keep referring back to that, in the infinite potential well, uh, there were different probabilities for each of the states and so an electron jumping from one to the other changes its location within the block. So that's movement of a charge inside a block of metal. All right, we are going to go back and do the, uh, for this block of copper, we're going to come back and we're going to bring back our 3D infinite potential well model. Um, and so we're going to say that the electrons are in these 3D states. We've already seen this, fortunately, I guess, for better or worse. Uh, we even saw this on the, the last midterm. Uh, so we said that when we solved the Schrodinger equation for this, it gave us a series of energy states. And they were given by these, um, the energies depended on the dimensions of the box. Uh, how much space did the electrons have to work with? And it depended on three quantum numbers, nx, ny, and nz. And uh, what we did is we wrote down the first kind of possible combinations for these. But once you've written down a number of these, you start to realize that this, this is pretty complicated. It, it's, it's kind of like um, um, it's kind of like a puzzle, right? Uh, how many different ways can you combine these different quantum numbers? Because that's going to tell us what the energy level pattern looks like. Okay, so um, one way, uh, or a standard, uh, approximation method we use is, is this. So that's what we're going to go through. So what we're going to do is take this energy formula we derived back in chapter 38 and we're going to replace nx, N, nx squared, ny squared plus nz squared with just plain old n squared. Now n squared is an integer but n itself might not be an integer. But what we're going to do is say this. All of these numbers that we listed here, those could be plotted on a three-dimensional coordinate system. So here is the nx axis, here is ny, here is nz. And what happens is that if we start placing cubes of distance 1 in this space that we've uh, defined, each one of these cubes represents one quantum state. What we've done is we've said those three numbers can be treated as a coordinate point in this three-dimensional uh, quantum state number space. And so if I calculate the volume of all of, the of all of these cubes, that volume is going to tell me how many quantum states there are. That's the trick that we use. So the volume calculated here is going to give us the states. Now the next thing we got to look at is, okay, if I'm, if I'm stacking cubes into that space and each one counts as one quantum state, um, how do I tell when the energy is increasing? Because I want to be able to calculate my energies in a way where as the quantum numbers go up, the energies go up. And the pattern here is that n squared uh, is equal to nx plus ny plus nz, the sum of all those squares, uh, that would mean that n itself is the radius 
And so the energy is directly proportional to the radius. So what we do with this space is we treat it, treat it as spherical shells. Each spherical shell corresponds to some number of quantum states that have the same energy. They have different sets of quantum numbers, but any quantum states that land on the same shell are going to have the same amount of energy. So what we do is this. We say, okay, to, to make sure we don't lose, we don't uh, miss any of the quantum states, uh, what we have to do is look at that shell. It's going to be a sphere. Uh, now, we're actually going to work from a volume and say, by the time I am out to a radius of little n, how many states have I included? And uh, the volume, when once we're out to little n, would be uh, one-eighth times the volume of a sphere. I'm only including uh, the octant that has the positive, positive, positive quantum numbers. It's not an entire sphere volume, but one-eighth. And then for each of those states that we've defined, uh, we're working with electrons, and the electrons are going to have the possibility of spin up or spin down. So I've got to uh, add a factor of two to keep track of the possible spin states. What that says is that n, a big N, is equal to pi over 3 times little n to the third. Now, the way big N works is this. Instead of, uh, instead of writing nx, n1, and nz with this complicated pattern of numbers, big N is defined in a way where we can just run through the integer numbers. n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. It just becomes a simple counting system. Now, the downside is that the energies aren't going to be, be exactly correct. But that's okay. It turns out that when we start using this to, um, and apply it to a block of metal with, you know, zillions of electrons in there, Avogadro's number type numbers of electrons, um, the energy approximations are going to be really good. And uh, what it enables us to do then is to substitute into our energy formula. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at that energy formula that we have right there, and uh, we're going to rewrite it in terms of one quantum number instead of three. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to take that n squared, and we're going to substitute for n the expression 3 over pi to the one-third n to the one-third. So that gets substituted in. Now, at the same time that we substitute in little n squared, we're also going to substitute uh, for L squared. What we are going to do is write that as volume to the one-third. So again, instead of the individual dimensions of our cube, we want that in terms of a volume. And instead of working with these three quantum numbers, nx, ny, nz, we just want to use this one quantum number, big N. All right. Uh, let's see what we got here. So that energy formula turns into this energy formula. And um, I, I apologize for this. I realized this after I'd written this up. Uh, I should have gone back and changed it, I guess. Uh, we're going to define a little n here, but it's not the same little n that we started with up here. Yeah, I should go back and change this. Uh, this represents n over v. In fact, I, I think on the next slide I changed it see what we've got here. Yeah, I did. So anyway, we have an energy formula. Let me go back to here. So I apologize, but instead of the little n that's right there, turn that into big N over big V. Okay, maybe make that change in your notes. Rewrite that as N over V. That's a better way to think about this. All right, let's move on and see if we can uh, calculate what these energies would be. So we're going to do this for copper. We're going to come back and calculate N over V. Now, for copper, we can put in its density, 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. We can put in its molar mass. Uh, we can convert, I like, converting into nanometers. So I got rid of the cubic centimeters and converted into nanometers. And then I used Avogadro's number when I put all those numbers together and canceled out all the units, 
What I ended up with was four copper, based on its density and its molar mass, there are 85 atoms of copper for every cubic nanometer. Oh, okay. So, uh, nanometers are really small. I guess that's hard to imagine. But if we get down to millimeters, and then we got to go a thousand times smaller to um, micrometers, and then another thousand times smaller to nanometers. If we cube those, there's 85 atoms of copper, very close to 85, uh, in each cubic nanometer. Now, uh, going back to um, the energy formula from the previous page, what it tells us is that when we look at, th this is the quantum number now, state number one, state number two, three, four, five, these numbers are going up. What we find is, um, Since the energy of the nth state depends on big N to the two-thirds power, what that says is that the energies are going up, but they're going up at a, a smaller rate than linear. So linear increase in energy would look like this, but this is a two-thirds power function. And so if I evenly space out the quantum numbers here, when I look at the energies associated with those, what I find is that the, the energy spacing is becoming a little less each time I go up in a state. The states are getting placed a little closer to each other, and we refer to that as the density of states. So if I do an energy diagram of my 4S band, and I place all of these energy states, they start out not quite so dense, but as they go farther and farther through, it becomes more and more dense. Now, what we said with the, four band, the 4S band is that I have enough electrons to fill half of the states. So let's fill half of them. Half will be filled in the band. Half of them will be empty. They won't have an electron in them, but they could. An electron could jump into one of those states uh, and become uh, a conducting electron. So for copper, we came up with this 85 atoms per cubic uh, um, nanometer uh, calculation. Now what we can do is we can flip the calculation around now that we have that value. So again, going back and forth here, what we were trying to do was find out the energy of each one of the states. And we said we could get that using this formula right here, and this formula had an N over V to the two-thirds in it. All right, um, so I'm using the formula from the previous page, and I'm just putting all the numbers in here. Uh, I'm using what I'm considering a shortcut. So where it says h squared over 8m, I'm putting a couple extra factors of c on top and some factors of c below. That's going to let me use hc as a shortcut on top and mc squared as a shortcut below. Uh, and you can see I, I, I put all the numbers in and wanted to make sure we were looking at everything uh, in this example. So 3 over pi to the 2 thirds. Uh, here is my hc squared. Here is my factor of 8. Here is mc squared. And uh, here is the 85 per cubic nanometer that we calculated for copper. Now that was the number of atoms, but remember each atom has one conduction electron, one 4s electron. So if I put in the number of atoms, that's the same thing as counting all the electrons. That's going to give me an n value that is going to place me right at the top of the filled states. So we call that the Fermi energy. Um, when we get to the very last state that has an electron in it. Uh, we call that the Fermi energy. That's how much kinetic energy um, that electron at the very top has. And that becomes an important quantity to, to, uh, to work from in uh, looking at, at condensed matter physics or solid state physics. And it's certainly become really important in uh, developing new semiconductor materials, uh, different kind of switching devices, transistors and such.
All right, so that's the Fermi energy, and I've got all the numbers, and I put those in, and it says that the Fermi energy is, is 7.06 EV for, uh, for copper. So copper, it says this, if I look at the 4S band, um, <clears throat> at absolute zero, so let's take the block all the way down to absolute zero. At absolute zero, uh, the electrons are going to be filled up until we run out of electrons. So the states will be filled, rather. So we're going to have the 4S states filled from the ground state all the way up to some amount of energy. And what we're finding is that those lowest electron states are going to have almost no kinetic energy to them. But by the time we look at those electrons in the, the, the last electrons, the ones that have the most kinetic energy, uh, that value is 7.06. Okay, so it gives you an idea of how much kinetic energy these electrons have. Now, none of this is addressing the potential energy. So the potential energy is another issue. Uh, the potential energy is going to be the interaction of these electrons with all of the nuclei in the uh, block of copper. Remember, these wave functions spread out over the entire block. And so any, all of these 4S electrons are actually being attracted towards all of the nuclei. Now, the nuclei have their core electrons, and that says that there's a shielding effect. But still, these electrons are going to be held in place due to the presence of all those nuclei. All right. Uh, so these are the kinetic energies. Now, this is the Fermi energy. Another number we might want to, to think about is what would be the highest kinetic energy within the 4S state, because, or the 4S band, uh, because we're going to have 2N uh, total number of states. So what we could do is, instead of using 85 per cubic nanometer to represent when we run out of electrons, uh, we could double that. 170 per cubic nanometer would be how many states are there. So 85 electrons per cubic nanometer, but 170 states total per cubic nanometer. And when we redo the calculations using that number, it doesn't, doesn't go up by a factor of 2. Remember, this is to the 2 thirds power. So it went up to 11.21 eV. So now we've mapped out this 4S band of electron quantum states. The lowest kinetic energies are almost zero. I guess we should put some numbers in and see what those look like. Um, and then by the time we get up to the Fermi energy, we are at 7.06 eV. And then when we get up to the uh, max energy for the band, those kinetic energies are 11.21. Okay. So that's another example of, uh, even at absolute zero, you are going to have electrons with significant amounts of kinetic energy. They, they don't all come to a stop. Um, electrons are spin-half particles. Uh, spin-half particles are called fermions. Uh, and spin-half particles have to have their own wave function. You can't put more than one spin-half particle into a wave function. And uh, this is called the Pauli principle. And so not all the electrons can drop into the ground state. Uh, I can only have a pair of electrons spin up, spin down in the lowest state. And then I've got to move up to the next available state. So even at absolute zero, lots of uh, kinetic energy. And then as the temperatures go up, right, when you get to Earth temperatures, 300 Kelvin, then you've got the possibility uh, of the electrons, some number of electrons, it turns out to be a very small fraction, but some small fraction of electrons are going to have enough energy that they can switch back and forth, and that's electrical conduction taking place. Now, getting back to that density of states, this was a formula we saw several slides back. That density of states formula says then, uh, how closely spaced are the uh, electron energy states, kinetic energy states, uh, as a function of energy? And so for this, we're going to go back and write down our energy formula that we had derived for. There's our quantum number right there. And what we'll do is we'll flip the equation around. 
what we'll do is uh, solve this for n. And so it says that if, this equation says, if you give me an energy, I can tell you which quantum number we're at. Right? So you might say, all right, 3.57 eV. How many electron states will we have climbed through by the time we get to that energy? And so if I put the energy in here and the mass of the electron, it'll tell me, oh yeah, for this block of copper, in order to get up to that energy, uh, we would have to step through this many quantum states. Then, the next step in solving for the density of states is to take dNDE. So what dNDE is telling us is this, is every time we go up uh, a small increment in energy, how many states are in that energy interval? So I move up a little bit dE, and then I count dN number of states, dE, dN, dE. And so this allows us, taking the derivative gives us a ratio of dN to dE, uh, and that's what this looks like. So this is telling us at what rate uh, the density increases, uh, the density of the states, and that's the expression. E to the one-half is telling us how dense. Now, what we also do here in order to define density of states is we factor out the volume effect. So we know, for example, if I have a block of copper that's twice as volume, twice the volume, of another block of copper, it's going to have twice as many electrons, it's going to have twice as many states packed together. And so what we do is we factor out that volume effect. So the density of states uh, has to do, it's a fundamental um, equation uh, telling us how closely the states will be packed per volume. Uh, and so there are going to be uh, tables or diagrams like this in your book uh, the density of states as a function of energy. So here is the Fermi energy, here is the maximum energy, and here is that energy to the one-half function. And what we can do is we can draw a bunch of narrow columns and say those narrow columns represent increments of dE. So each one of these is dE in width. And if I take that and multiply by the density of states, and then multiply by the volume, uh, that will tell me how many states there are within that interval. So for copper, we found out the Fermi energy was at 7.06, the E max was at 11.21. Um, most of these states uh, are going to be filled with electrons. Most of these states are, are not. At absolute zero, there's a firm boundary between the two. Uh, but this is how we would go in and count how many states there are. Uh, we could integrate this density of function between different energies and uh, determine um, the number of states. Again, each one of these little, uh, these narrow um, histogram bins uh, represents the number of states within a certain energy range. And to get that, we multiply by volume, we multiply by the density of states function. Okay. If we integrate and calculate an area under that curve, that will tell us how many states there are um, within that particular energy range. All right. So, um, this example, here's an example that they're giving us now. Uh, they're saying, okay, let's go ahead and try this out, see how this works. Uh, we've done all this work with electron states in copper. Um, how many states are there in the 4S band of a one cubic centimeter piece of copper metal, uh, specifically in the energy range between 5 eV and 5.5 eV? So how many states are we looking at that would fall into that range of uh, energies. So what we can do is this. Now, the book is going to encourage you to carry out the integration that we just looked at, and that works fine. But if you carry out the integration, uh, what you're going to end up with is just using the energy formula that we had already written down. So let me bring that back, because I did not get it copied under this slide. 
Aha! So here it is. This is the formula that we're going to use. So what I can do is I can put in the energy and then put in the volume and this will tell me how many states there are that we have to step through in order to reach that particular energy. Okay, so think of that. And then here we are with our copper sample. They say that it's 1.0 cubic centimeters. Now 1.0 cubic centimeters is going to be um, 1 times 10 to the 21 cubic nanometers. And uh, so what I did was I, I just plugged into that formula. And uh, at an energy of 5 EV for our 1 cubic centimeter block of copper, uh, I found that I was at the 50.7 times 10 to the 21 state. That's the number, and you go, wow, that's a lot of quantum states uh, to step through to get to that energy. And then it said, actually, to get to the 5.5 EV, I'm going to have to step through even more states. And uh, so I used that formula that we just took a look at and calculated N2. Uh, N2... Um, was um, equal to 58.6 times 10 to the 21 state. Um, and so now I can take the difference between those. What's happening is this. Uh, here's my 4S band diagram. Here's the Fermi energy. Here's zero. Here's my max energy. Uh, we had found out for copper that the Fermi energy is at 7.06. Now, uh, 5 eV and 5.5 eV are down below the Fermi energy in here somewhere. And what we've done with this calculation is find out just how many states are we talking about. So within that range of energies, uh, there's uh, 7.9, 10 to the 21 uh, states that are um, included in that range. And uh, we're guessing... Uh, and this, this is very reasonable, we're guessing that they're all filled with electrons. They're just, 100% of those states are filled with electrons. Uh, at, at room temperature, uh, even at higher temperatures, because it's so far below the Fermi energy. Uh, we're going to find out that the only, only a small fraction of electrons are able to move into those higher energy states. And, and it's really only the ones that are already very close to the Fermi energy. The ones that are well below the Fermi energy are, it's just very unlikely that um, any of these states would go vacant, any of these low energy states. All right, so that's pretty much it. We've counted the number of states within that range of energies, and we've identified the fact that pretty much all these states uh, are going to be filled. They're all going to be filled with electrons. So, um, one more diagram. I guess this is kind of the same thing that we had drawn out here. Uh, so, they are writing. So, I got to get rid of this N naught here. That's G. That is the. Um, this is. Um, well, I guess they've multiplied by the volume. That's probably the case. I'm not sure why they're using NO. But it's our density of state formula. And what we're finding is that at zero kelvins, uh, everything below the Fermi energy is filled, but everything above the Fermi energy is empty. Uh, and that's the Fermi energy formula, and that's the formula that we had uh, derived in some detail. So the three-dimensional... Um, infinite potential well model, we've, we've looked at that in some detail. All right, what happens at higher temperatures? And what's going to happen at higher temperatures is this, and now I'm, I'm, I'm seeing what they're using N0 for. So what there is, um, is there's a probability function. There is a probability function that any given state would have an electron present occupying that state. Now, the, 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 form, the energy or the uh, density of states, the G sub E, 
factor here is that first mathematical expression, and then over here is what we are calling f sub e, and f sub e is telling us the probability that the state will be occupied. Now, we're not going to look at this in extraordinary detail. Um, boy, why did they do this? Actually, this e to the one-half belongs over on this side. So I'm going to take this e to the one-half and move it over here and just replace this with a one. Um, but what, what's happening here is, if I take a look at this formula for the occupation probability, uh, once we go up to high temperature, uh, this combined product of these two functions, and that's what's giving us n naught uh, as a function of e, so it's the, the product of those two functions. And what that looks like is, uh, since this function basically follows the density of states, until we get close to the Fermi energy, and then instead of having a sharp cutoff uh, at this higher temperature, and look, we're at 1200 Kelvin, I don't know at what point this copper block melts, but we're at a pretty high temperature. And so at this high temperature, what's happening is the probability of these states just below the Fermi energy, they're no longer like 100% sure there's going to be an electron. That's what this function is representing. So as we get close to the uh, Fermi energy, there becomes less and less of a probability. And then there turns out that there's a small probability of electrons being, the, being in these excited states. So 1200 Kelvin, though, that's a pretty high temperature. So you can see that the uh, combined effect of density of states times probability of electron filling that state, that combined effect of how many electrons are there at each energy, uh, that's that combined blue line. And it gets to be a little curvy around the Fermi energy at these really high temperatures. Now, it's worth pointing out that before we can get to the point where this curve becomes very significant, the metal melts. So um, the solid metal melts uh, and vaporizes at some point. So um, we don't get things that are, that are very much more distorted than what we're looking at right here. You don't have that many excited electrons to work with, uh, even at these higher temperatures. Okay, so here we're just being asked to um, determine the Fermi energy, and we, we've done that. Um, it talks very briefly, uh, so I did leave these slides in. Uh, it talks briefly about, um, well, this is the free electron model. And here it's saying, <laughs> example 4011, uh, this is the incorrect classical speed calculation. So I appreciated that they actually said the incorrect. It's like, we're going to go ahead and do the calculation anyway, but it's incorrect. Because as we said, velocity doesn't mean much in a block of copper looking at the electron states. Energy does. So we can certainly calculate energy levels and where is the Fermi energy going to be. And, but there, there's no velocity. It's not like there's a trajectory path that the electrons are taking. So anyway, it says these electrons have enough kinetic energy that if they were moving, you know, if I gave this much kinetic energy to an electron and had it heading off in some direction, its speed would be 1.6, 10 to the 6 meters per second. So you compare that with gas molecules, right? Gas molecules in the air, how fast are they moving? And gas molecules in the air are moving at like four or 500 meters per second. But these um, electrons have an, an, a kinetic energy that's equivalent to moving millions of meters a second. So it, it's, a, it's a, an extraordinary amount of energy. And again, they're just stuck with that much energy because there aren't any lower energy quantum states that they can drop into, and every electron insists on having its own quantum state. All right, kind of a review of what's happened here in some sense. So what we're saying is when we brought that block of copper together, uh, what happened? Now, this is, this is uh, energy as a function of atomic separation.
So what we're saying is we're bringing in some material that has 1s and 2s states in it. So may maybe it's lithium or something like that. So here is a bunch of lithium atoms being brought together. Now, the way that we want to read this atomic separation chart is we actually want to start out here. Out here is where the lithium atoms are all isolated from each other. And then as we move from right to left on the diagram, what we're doing is little by little bringing the lithium atoms closer together. So when the lithium atoms are all off by themselves, they have these well-defined 1s and 2s states, and we have the quantum, um, the wave functions that we looked at in chapter 39 for those states, the 1s and the 2s. But as I bring them closer and closer together, and the electrons from one lithium begin to interact with the nuclei from the other lithiums and, and vice versa, what happens is we transition from these 1s and 2s states into something like we looked at for the 4s band. So the 4s band forms. So if we only have two atoms coming together, then we said what happens is there's a bonding state and there's an anti-bonding state. And if we can get the bonding state to drop a little bit in energy, then those two atoms will come together and form a molecule. That's what's happening here. And then if we bring them too close together, then they begin to push away from each other. So, but there is the presence of a local minimum in terms of energy, and that's what holds these lithium atoms together. Well, what happens if instead of just having a pair of lithium atoms, what if we have, I guess we've got six. So we're bringing six lithium atoms together, and what will happen is we'll get six different uh, molecular quantum states for the electrons. Now, if this is lithium, let's see, lithium is element three. Um, we've got one electron in the 2s state. Uh, what would happen is we would pair the electrons, spin up, spin down in these lowest states, and if all we do is occupy these lowest states, that's a reduction in energy and the lithium bonds form. So lithiums will stick to other lithiums. If it's helium, so let's say it's not lithium, let's say it's element 4, which is helium, what if uh, the two helium atoms come together, and they have a pair of electrons here, and they have a pair of electrons in the 2s state also. Well then, not only are these states filled, but these states are filled also. Now that's a bonding state, but that's an anti-bonding state, and it's very anti-bonding. There's no such thing as helium-2. Helium-2 does not form, because when we look at the energies of the available states for the, the four electrons, each helium bringing in two electrons, uh, the overall combination of energies would be higher than the energies of just leaving them apart. So helium-2 doesn't form, but lithium-2 does form. And lithium will attract in, in, in any numbers. All right, now what happens is if we bring in a zillion lithiums, um, so we bring in a zillion lithiums, and we form an entire block of lithium metal, then instead of getting these distinct states, uh, instead of treating them as distinct states, we treat them as a continuous set of states. So here, this becomes the 1s band of energy states, and this becomes the 2s band of energy states. And for lithium, only half of this band would be filled, and if they've got the diagram right, that would suggest that there's an overall reduction, and I don't think they do, um, an overall reduction uh, in terms of energies. Notice how there's still an energy gap between the 1s band and the 2s band. Now, that doesn't always happen. It can be that when you form these um, energy bands of states that there's overlap between them. And so uh, instead of having distinct 1s and 2s states like we have here, there are going to be situations, for example, 2s and 2p. 2s and 2p are so similar in energy, those energy bands would overlap. So anyway, if you're going into something like condensed matter, 
physics or engineering, engineering new semiconductor kind of materials. This is the kind of stuff that um, you're going to be presented in terms of kind of the theoretical uh, basis for uh, what's going on in those fields. All right, and I'm thinking we're probably at a point, let me just check real quick, but I think we're at the point where we probably want to take a break and wrap this lecture up. We are. So I'm going to stop right there.